This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 24. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. You're joined by yours truly, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Johnny... Before you even open your mouth here, it's the last day of your 30s. We're so re- you're putting that out there, are I you? I am. I you am. Are. We're recording this on January 18th, and tomorrow someone turns 40. I love that. You're such a prick. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I did wake up this morning and think, hey, I'm done my 30s. How's that feeling? Yep. How does it feel? I feel pretty good about it because truthfully, the older I get, the more wisdom I get, the more grays I get on the beard. I actually don't feel bad about that. I feel like I'm just starting to get it like really together. I've had it together for a while, but now I feel like I'm really getting it together. Age wise, I remember my dad's 50th birthday and the big celebration we had. I don't remember 40. So from my standpoint, to be able to celebrate it with my family and just go to the next year is going to be exciting. Like I'm happier where I am now at 39 compared to where I was at 30. And I was doing pretty damn well at 30. So it's a good thing. You prick. (laughs) Well, I got to throw it out there. Uh, So for everyone listening, by the time this episode comes out, uh, Jonathan will be 40. Be sure to send him a a birthday wish. Um, I do want to put you on the spot a little bit more. One lesson, top lesson in the last decade in Jonathan's life. What would it be? Oh, I think it fits so well with our guest today. Don't care what other people think, guys. Like, there's just not enough time in this world to care about it. Like, when you actually go and do what you want to do, things come together. People are around you. If you've you, if you've supported them, they want nothing but to support you back. And if they don't, go find other friends. Like, life's too short. That's it. Man, that is awesome. And you are good at it, Jonathan. I have to, you know, and I, that's why I love being around you. Um, cause I'm, I'm not as strong in that area. I'm getting better, but I, I see you do that. And we'll have chats even about this podcast where it's like, well, can we say that? And you're like, who cares? Yeah, we can. So, yeah, I, that's, I, I appreciate that. And sometimes I, we talked about this, you know, sometimes I should care more and, and there's that other part of the pendulum. Um, and I do care. There's a lot of things I care a lot about, but, uh, negativity or people that shouldn't be in your life, get rid of them. It, it's not worth it. And really if I'm 40 now, that means I'm, I'm hopefully just under half of my life, right. Is already gone. So why do I want to worry about people that, you know, shouldn't be part of my life anyway? It's no. not worth it. That's fair. You're going to live over a hundred. You're only 40% of the way there. Oh, I doubting that, but you never know. <laughs> hey, well, I feel like now we get, we get double Johnny time today. Cause that was like a quick tip, but now I'm throwing it right back to you for the official quick tip you're just burning me over last week that's what's happened here i get it this is what happens when you yeah you knew payback was coming you knew it was okay i'm gonna be really quick here because mike's talking too much (laughs) so my quick tip for today we are in the throes of winter uh i'm speaking of this as a lesson to myself my quick tip is let's go enjoy something right now in the throes of january and covid which we could normally only do in the summertime. So I'll give you my example. I'm going to go book a swimming session at the pool where we are, just because I never do that in the winter. It's going to switch. It's going to flip the switch for me, make me feel good. Uh, kind of remind me of summer a little bit in the middle of January. So my quick tip, flip the switch a little bit, go think of something the opposite of what you normally do and go do it. Nice. 
Okay, let's uh, dive in. Another amazing guest. I mean, we just had a phenomenal conversation. Uh, we went a little long, uh, but I'm not even apologizing for that because it was fantastic. So with us today is Dr. Carrie Nelson. Uh, Dr. Carrie Nelson grew up in Denver, Colorado. She is a 2016 graduate of Kansas State University and completed a rotating internship at Wheat Ridge Animal Hospital. She initially started down the path towards becoming a criticalist, but made the difficult decision to leave a critical care program in New York after six months. And just kind of a side note on this, you know, we dive pretty deep on that in this conversation and Carrie is exceptionally vulnerable. And I think this is a conversation that needs to continue to happen. Um, so Carrie, if you're listening to this, thanks so much for opening up with us. Um, following that, she moved back to Denver uh, and fortunately was able to reconnect with her love for emergency medicine. After working at a large specialty hospital in, in a Denver suburb for two years, she joined Veterinary Emergency Group, uh, which we refer to as VEG, uh, in 2019. She is currently the medical director of VEG Denver, which opened in September of 2020. Dr. Nelson loves managing critical care cases, especially sepsis, metabolic and acid-based derangements, and polytrauma. She is passionate about teaching and loves working for a company that gives her the opportunity to train newly graduated veterinarians. Outside of veterinary medicine, Dr. Nelson can be found running marathons, skiing, riding horses, reading books on leadership and personal growth, and spending lots of time with family and friends. So without any further ado, I give you Dr. Carrie Nelson. All right, Carrie, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's so good to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. So you are another one of, um, I guess, the social media connections that we've made through the podcast. Uh, we certainly didn't know each other before Jonathan and I headed down this road. And when I seen your platform, your platform on Instagram, the thing that drew me to you uh, immediately was just how much you love uh, your job and love where you work. And I kind of right away put you on the, the list that, you know, we have to reach out and have you on the show. So I guess here we are. So thanks. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I feel like um, a lot, a lot of people have said that to me about my social media platform and we've actually had quite a few um, people get hired because of that. And um, so a lot of my classmates or people I used to work with have reached out and said, man, you look like you're really happy doing emergency medicine. I, I want to do what you're doing. And then there's other people who say that looks like a cult, which it is. We totally are a cult, um, but we're a very happy cult. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, um, I'm, I'm glad that that radiates through because I, I love my job and I love my company so much. Man, I'm, I'm already going to go on tangents because when you say that, like there is nothing uh, better, like as a, say an advertising space than seeing someone that's just beaming about their place of work, mm -hmm. you know, like there's nothing that can speak better about the workplace culture than someone endorsing it just on their own. So you're right. Like it grabbed me and pulled me in. I was like, we got to find out what's going on. So yeah, I guess with that, maybe uh, for our listeners, Tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your journey and your road uh, to finding yourself in Denver kind of with veg. Yeah. So, um, I mean, my journey starts in Denver, born and raised in, in Colorado, grew up here. Um, and then I went to Boston University, originally thinking that I was going to uh, major in broadcast journalism. I wanted to be in sports broadcasting. And, um, after uh, my first year, I very quickly realized that I really needed animals in my life. And it was actually, um, the husband of a woman who I worked for the summer between my first and second year of vet school. Um, I was taking care of her horses and one of them kept getting injured. And I was there every day, like, I mean, you know, multiple times a day, taking care of this dumb horse that kept injuring herself. Um, and he came down and he, so he was a, um, a human doctor and he said, you know, this is what you should be doing. Like you, you right. should be practicing medicine on animals. And I don't know how, why it was just that simple, but it was that simple. And I just said, okay, I'm going to go to vet school. So, um, I ended up uh, transferring from, um, Boston university back to the university of Denver. I just felt like BU was a little bit too big. Um, and I'm, I'm just a Colorado girl and I keep coming back here every time I leave. So, um, I graduated from DU, um, and then I got into, uh, Kansas state. So I went directly from, um, under 
undergrad into vet school. Um, so I did four years in the little apple, uh, Manhattan, Kansas. I went back and forth about what I wanted to do in terms of, do I want to do equine medicine? Do I want to do small animal? Do I want to specialize? Do I not want to specialize? I mean, it was really all over the place. Um, and I finally, after doing enough externships in equine medicine, I was like, yeah, you know, I love horses. They tend to do the same things, which is like lameness, colic, laminitis, like over and over and over again. Yep. Um, and, and I just didn't feel like they were living a good quality of life, the, the vets who I was shadowing. Um, and so I ultimately decided that, that small animal was the route that I wanted to go. Um, when I started my internship at Wheat Ridge Animal Hospital back in Denver, um, I thought that I was going to pursue an ophthalmology residency. And um, I, uh, I initially, I mean, I even went to ACVO. I like, I went out and um, kind of a bunch of places. Yeah. Um, and I almost ended up at a, a private practice um, res optho residency. And then I had my critical care rotation at um, Wheat Ridge. And I really just fell in love with critical care. Um, we didn't really have critical care at um, when we were at K-State because the only criticalist that we had was a, a double boarded in anesthesia. So she only did anesthesia. So we really had ER and then soft tissue surgery would kind of manage their own patients and internal medicine would manage patients, but it wasn't the, tr the same thing as a critical care rotation. Yep. So I last minute applied for um, critical care residencies, um, ended up scrambling, ended up in New York City, um, did not really put a lot of good thought into, you know, what program I was going into. Um, I actually really wanted to take one that was in LA, but uh, being a, a dumb, um, God, how old was I? 26 year old at the time. I was in love with a guy who um, was moving to the East coast and I wanted to be closer to him. So that was like, honestly, the deciding factor, which is not good. Um, you know, it, it really should have come down more to my education. And, um, you know, I had visited the place in LA and I hadn't visited the place in, in New York. Um, and anyway, it, it was not the right program for me. I ended up leaving after six months, but if I had never done that program, I never would have met David Bessler. Okay. So when I left that program, I moved back to Denver. I worked at a 24 seven um, specialty and ER hospital here called VRCC. Yep. Um, I loved my time with them. It was great because I still really got a lot of specialty training. I could still walk down the hall and, you know, chat with the cardiologist and say, hey, can you look at these chest rads for me? Things like that. Um, so I was, I was with them for two years. But when I, I went to IVEX in 2018 in New Orleans, mm -hmm. um, and I was chatting with um, a gal who um, was, I, I took over her room in New York City, so she was leaving her residency when I moved to New York City. And um, ironically, she's now the criticalist at VRCC. So it's like kind of all come full circle. Um, but sh I was chatting with her and uh, she introduced me to David Bessler. And um, we started chatting and he immediately, you know, said, uh, well, we, we clearly share a lot of the same values. And I, I think you're really wonderful. And I would love for you to come work with me. And at the time, Veg was pretty small. And I said, no, I'm not going to move back to the East coast. That's never going to happen again. Like I'm, you know, I'm happy being in, in Colorado and I'm, I'm not leaving my family. And he said, okay, well, that's fine. I'll just build you a hospital in Denver. And I completely thought this guy was full of shit. I was like, he's, he's bluffing, whatever, but they, I mean, the, the team, they were just so fun to hang out with. And I, I didn't really go with anybody. Like there were a few people from my current job who were there, but I didn't bring, you know, I didn't have a, a, a significant other or anything like that. And, and veg was kind of just like, come out with us, come like, we're, let's go get dinner. Let's get drinks. And, and they just kind of, you know, wooed me. And I was like, okay, that sounds fun. Um, and I didn't really think a lot of it for a couple months because I, I didn't hear from, um, from Bessler for a little bit, but sure enough, he reached out to me and he said, let's get on the phone. I want to talk to you. I was serious about, you know, bringing a hospital to Denver. And so we got on the phone when I was driving back from Vail and spoke the entire time. It's like a two hour ride. Um, and so, I mean, we, 
we had a really great conversation and then he flew me out to New York to see his hospitals and see the way they work because it's so dramatically different from your um, traditional emergency room. Um, and I immediately fell in love with the veg way and every single person that I met was just so excited about their job and so passionate. And, um, it was a no brainer to me that I, you know, I knew that I needed to move that direction as, as much as I loved the RCC, I knew that there wasn't really any place for me to move up there and it didn't feel like a sustainable career for me long-term. And, and that's what veg has done for so many ER doctors and, um, is, is that, you know, it's made it into something sustainable and, it, um, you know, allowed us to move into a position of leadership. Um, so it, it took two years. Um, you know, I, I went to IVEX um, in uh, September of 2018 and we opened our hospital doors in Denver in September of 2020. So it was a long process, but it was so unbelievably worth it. And I, I feel very fortunate every day of my life that I got a seat on this rocket ship because it's amazing. Yep. Man, that is awesome. Okay, we're gonna we're definitely gonna come back, um, dive into some of those shared values, um, you know, and and the and the culture in the clinic. I just wanna wanna go back and touch on, um, what year did you graduate with your DVM? Twenty sixteen. So I've only been out for five years, which is, I never in a million years would have thought that someone would be like, hey, we're gonna put you in charge of a a hospital this soon, you know, out of um, out, out of school, but. I actually feel quite prepared to do so because I've had so much support, but um, that's what's really empowering about our company is there actually are a lot of, I would say the majority of people that work for veg are women in their thirties. So, okay. Nice. yeah. Okay. And then I, I just want to spend a bit of time and touch on um, when you were in your rotating internship and you said after six months or so, uh, you made a difficult decision to step away. No, we- not rotating internship. I, oh, I sorry. Internship. That was into her residency. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, can we, can we kind of speak to that? Cause you know, there may be people that are finding themselves in situations that are out of alignment for them. And it, it takes a lot of courage to make decisions like this. So yep. yeah. can you kind of walk us through sort of how you're feeling at that point and how you come to this decision? Yeah, I, it was, it was really hard for me to actually put you know, words to, to why I was so unhappy. Of course I could say, you know, the hours were crazy. I was basically on call all the time. I was getting paid $30,000 to live in New York city. I couldn't enjoy any part of my life. Um, but, but I had good mentors, you know, like they, they really, they were good, good teachers. And I, and I was learning a lot. Um, but I still, I felt so unfulfilled and I felt so unappreciated and I, got to a point where I remember thinking if I didn't walk to work with my dog next to me every day, like I, I would just step into traffic, not to kill myself, but just because I thought it sounded nicer to like fracture a hip and sit in a hospital on a fentanyl CRI for a week instead of go to work. And the second that those thoughts started coming into my mind, I, I was like, this, this is not good. And I very specifically remember one night that we had a patient on a ventilator and I, um, had to stay until, I mean, I was probably there 18, 19 hours at least. And it was the end of that shift. And, um, the, the owners had elected euthanasia. And I remember pulling up the euthanasia solution and looking at it and just being like, wow, this would be really easy to just throw this bottle into my jacket and take it home with me. And the second that I had that thought, I was like, I'm done. And I've, I've never, you know, truly gone down the the route of thinking about suicide. But the fact that that even like came into my mind, I knew that I had to stand up for myself. The sad thing is I did not feel comfortable bringing up mental health issues as a reason for leaving that program. Um, I I told them, and and to be fair, you know, I did, I did need to be with my family, but um, I kind of fabricated a little bit. And I still feel guilty about that to this day that I made it sound like there were kind of dire reasons for me to go home. And there were reasons for me to go home, but like no one was dying. Um, But that's, that is how desperate I was, is that I felt that I had to use my family um, needing me instead of me needing to walk away from something because my mental health was suffering so much. Um, 
And I mean, I, I remember, you know, just feeling this immense amount of guilt because I, I made the decision to pursue a path in critical care, not because of me. I made that decision because I thought that that's what my peers and my mentors expected me to do. And so of course, when I left, I, I just thought, wow, I wonder how many people are judging me for making this decision right now. And I'm not, not a super religious person, but I've always believed in some sort of higher power and, you know, that everything happens for a reason and, and you're kind of guided down a certain path. And when I moved back a week later, my horse Kramer, who's actually on the wall behind me that you guys can see, um, my, my childhood horse Kramer, who I had had since I was 13, I had him for 16 years. Um, he got sick with cancer and passed away. And I knew at that point in time that I had made the right decision for me. And then it was just a series of things that, that, you know, validated that I did make the right decision for myself. But I knew that I would have never been able to live with myself if I hadn't been there for Kramer when he passed away. And it was a very beautiful, peaceful death. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad that I got to be part of that. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was really, really shameful to, to feel that my mental health was not strong enough to get me through a program like that. Yeah. Wow. I mean, thank you for sharing that, that that's so vulnerable. Um, and you know, there, I, I know that there are other people, um, you know, this, this sort of story, you know, the details may vary a bit, but that, that get feeling that way and can get caught in it for a really long time. Um, because you have these factors, you know, you have your internal factors and then all these external factors. Um, you know, it sounded like once you recognized it, that you moved through it quickly, like to the decision and then executing, um, you know, any, any thoughts or comments on, on what helped you move through that, you know, to make that decision and take action. I really heavily relied on my, my friends and family. And I, I mean, so I, I had probably a 30 or 40 minute walk home from work every day, like to work and home from work. So I, I spent over an hour walking every day. And I, I called my mom every single night for, you know, multiple nights in a row and talked through this. And so even though it was a decision that was made, you know, over the span of only a couple of weeks, it was not a decision that was made lightly by any means. Um, but I, I really needed to lean on them. And, and I did end up, I, I spoke to some of my mentors at Wheat Ridge as well, and um, kind of talked, talked through some things, you know, some difficulties, because I, I think it's important, of course, your friends and family can help you, you know, to some extent, but they also don't necessarily know 100% what you're going through if, if they haven't been in the veterinary field themselves. And so I think the more that you can reach out to other people, the more it's going to help you. I actually had someone reach out to me on Instagram recently who was in a critical care residency and it was, she was not being treated well. Um, and I was so glad that, you know, that she knew that she could talk to me. We had actually never spoken, you know, in person and we had a zoom meeting and I, it felt very good to be able to provide that amount of support and kind of help her, um, you know, see that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and to, to not feel ashamed for leaving something that's, that's not working well for you. That's not serving, you know, your, serving you in terms of, are you going to get to the goals that you want to get to? And not only in your career, but who you are as a person, how do you develop yourself emotionally, spiritually, everything like that. If you don't have the energy to give to yourself at the end of the day, because all you've been doing is, you know, taking care of sick pets and, um, you know, having upset owners talk to you all the time. And, you know, then, then you got to cram in the, the pathophysiology of, you know, pulmonary thromboembolism or whatever it is that you happen to be working on kind of that day. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I think you really have to have the right people to lean on. And I think that you need to not be ashamed to talk about it. And that's easier said than done. But I think there's been a really big movement lately in veterinary medicine where people are finally talking about this. It's not so taboo anymore. Um, and so I, I hope that, you know, I get to be part of that movement too, in, in voicing what I went through and, and saying, listen, just because this is what other people, you know, went through and they were treated this way in their residency, it doesn't mean that that's okay anymore. Yeah. 
I, and I mean, this is, this is a really important conversation. And yep. I think there's a, there's a very big distinction uh, between something that is just hard and something that's not serving you, right? Like, you, as you said, it, it wasn't serving you. It wasn't going to get you where you needed to go right. um, versus just being hard. Because I mean, to be, to be blunt, like veterinary medicine is hard. We're going to have tough cases. We're going to have patients that pass away. Um, so, I, I mean, what, it, what is it or what advice could you give someone for maybe trying to, to get in touch with focusing on like, is this serving me, right? You know, like um, to, to honor that and use that as their decision criteria. Right. Well, I, I think one thing that I tell people when they're on the fence about whether or not they want to specialize is, do you wake up every single morning and think to yourself, I, I can only be a veterinary neurologist. And that's the only thing that I ever want to do for the rest of my life. And I will eat, sleep and breathe it. And nothing else in this world is going to make me happy. You know, and if that's not the case and you're doing it for external reasons, if you're doing it just because you think that, you know, that's what people expect of you and, you know, oh, you know, wh whatever topic you choose, whether it's internal medicine or optho or neuro or surgery, you're like, oh, okay, well, I, I think I kind of like it. That's not how it should be. It should be that you wake up every morning and you love what you do. And I now get to say that I now, you know, feel that way. And are there times where it's a little exhausting, you know, dealing with an upset customer is really hard. Like every time we've gotten a bad review, that is really difficult to, to stomach. But at the same time, then I, you know, I come out of that conversation. I listen to those owners concerns. I address them. And, you know, and then I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Like I have the ability, if, if we need to refund something because we truly made a mistake, my company gave me the ability to do that. And, you know, and I, I really, at the end of the day, I really do love my job. And I think, you know, if you're at a point where every single morning you're thinking I would really much rather go back to sleep. That's not a good thing. Like, I think people just think that that is normal, that they're just supposed to feel that exhausted, but it's, it's really not. And um, yeah. And I, I understand that that can be a really hard line to delineate, you know, is, is it just hard or is it truly something that is not serving me and, and not helping me? And that's something that it might take weeks or months or maybe even years to really figure that out and figure out what your place in veterinary medicine is and your place in the world is. Um, but you, you have to reconnect with yourself and listen to yourself and ask yourself, like, am, am I getting up every morning excited to do what I do? Yeah. If I can jump on one piece that I think was also mentioned, but I think is really important as well too, is that fear factor of what are people going to think? Yeah. That fear factor of external validation for getting into a program, which I know is so big and then having to walk away from that. And what are people going to think? What am I going to be looked at? Um, my guess is that two or three years later now, that really plays no part in your world now for what you're doing in this day and age. Yeah. No, now, now I don't care. I mean, I, you know, going, going through vet school, I was always someone who very much cared about what people yeah. thought of me. I always wanted to be, you know, top of the class, straight A student. I wanted people to look at me and see that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I, I got my first choice internship and it was an incredible internship. And then I didn't match to a residency and the program I actually started was technically a critical care internship. Um, but it was, like the exact same thing as the first year residency program. So that was even more reason for me to say, I got to walk away from this because it would have been four years total. Yep. Plus the company would have made me commit to another three years of working for that hospital after that. And I was like, okay, I can't even fathom seven years of this. There's no way. Um, but yeah, I, th I think as time went on, um, the, the shame factor kind of went away and it actually ended up turning into something that I'm really proud of. And I'm, I'm proud that I had the bravery to walk away from it and that I'm now able to talk about it with such candor because I previously I would have, you know, said, oh yeah, I, I left for personal reasons and there was stuff going on. And that's not the reason I left because my mental health was in the shitter and I, it, it was not going to, to come back from that. 
And, you know, I, you, we, we hear about people taking their lives left and right in veterinary medicine. And I was like, I'm not about to be one of them. And I'm not about, about to let anyone else, you know, think that this is something that's going to happen to them because no one else will stand up for them and no one else will speak out. And so now that that place of shame is, is now something that I'm immensely proud of that I, I get to share my story and, and help other people through these mental health struggles. Excellent. Yeah, that's amazing. And Carrie, you should be proud. I mean, this is yeah. an amazing, amazing share. Um, it takes a lot of courage. And even when we were chatting here, um, when, when you touched on kind of veg and finding your role that you are now, like your face just lights up and you smile and you can see, um, you know, the, the confidence that like you took that leap of faith and now here you are in a role that, you know, like lights you up every day. So let's kind of shift over to that 2018. Um, you meet, uh, David Bessler, who's the CEO of veg and you talked about shared values. Um, can you tell us about some of that? Like what were the values that this kind of conversation and connection were built on? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know about veg, no. we, the way that we operate is very different from your traditional ER. So even just from the way that the hospital is laid out, when someone walks into our hospital, they actually walk straight into the treatment area. And then the exam rooms are built off of that. So when they come in, we always promise you're going to see a doctor right away. And um, so they, they come into this open treatment area. They can stay with their pet as long as they want to. There is no such thing as in the back. We don't separate people and their pets. I've had people watch me do endoscopies, laceration repairs, unblock cats, like absolutely anything that they want to watch, they get to be a part of it. Um, before COVID hit, you know, we would have people stay in the hospital overnight. I still remember the first time um, I was working at a, one of our veg hospitals and on Long Island. And um, I set up this woman in an exam room because she wanted to stay overnight with her dog. I got her a mattress. I ordered her food. We like, we had dinner together. We put on Netflix and she just like hung out on the mattress next to her dog, watching Netflix, eating dinner. And I was just like, this is what it should, this is how it should feel. But the, the way that, you know, D Bessler and I kind of got into that conversation um, was, you know, at, at my previous job, I really felt that there there was a lot of negativity in terms of judgment put on owners. And, um, you know, someone would, would go do a triage in a room, which I now feel so ass backwards to me. I hate it so much. Like the idea of someone sitting in a room, you know, hundreds of feet away from the treatment area. And then, then they wait there for hours and it could be something that I could get in and out of there in two seconds. I could just say, okay, great. Like let's admit your dog. Um, and I'm going to keep it here until I can put stitches in. And then, you know, you leave rather than having them sit there for four hours. It's so stupid. But anyway, they, you know, they would come back to me and they would say, well, this dog has been sick for a week. This owner clearly doesn't care about their pet or, um, you know, this person's not going to have any money because it's a Hispanic family of five or whatever judgment it was like they would place judgment on those people. And I just, I, I hated that that was kind of the, the energy that was going into the, our, our career. It was just like, we're, there, we're all here because we have a shared value of loving animals, right? And um, anytime that a customer is frustrated, that's how you talk them down. You say, I'm here because I, I love animals. And like, we have the same shared goal, which is that we want your pet to feel better. Yep. And we can't focus on getting animals to feel better if the focus is on judging people. And if someone's taken a week to bring their dog into the hospital because they've been sick, you don't know why that is, you know, that it, it could be any number of other things that are going on in their life. And the bottom line is that they're there seeking veterinary treatment right then. So, you know, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. And when with veg having this open floor plan, the owners are there. Our customers are with us. So, you know, there is no negativity. It's all just about being able to find a way to say yes. And, um, that, that was kind of the conversation. I mean, I wish I remembered the actual like nitty gritty of everything that Bessler and I spoke about, but you were in new Orleans. You can't remember it all. <laughs> I was at that same conference. There, good conference. I think there were a couple <laughs> drinks. Yeah. Be before that conversation. So, 
Most definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you just, David Bessler is the, one of the most kindest, the most kindest, the, one of the kindest humans I have ever met in my life. And it just, it, it truly radiated from him how much he wanted to change veterinary medicine and, and from every single perspective, from the pet's perspective, from the owner's perspective and for his employees, you know, he wanted to make this a sustainable career. I've had people say to me left and right that being an emergency veterinarian is not a sustainable career. And I am so grateful that, that David Bessler has completely turned that on, you know, it's, it's had that whole belief and, and really built this, this empire of successful, happy emergency veterinarians. And um, yeah, I mean, I just, I could see that energy, energy right from the start. And, you know, we'll always talk about how like veggies can recognize other veggies. And, and he, he knew that he took, you know, one, um, one look and, and could see my energy and see my passion and, um, you know, immediately kind of pegged me as a veggie and I didn't know it yet. But then once I spent more time with the other veggies, I was like, yep, this is the place for me. I'm never going to work for any other company. Oh man, man, this is awesome. There's a few things jump out. One is I remember I had a mentor can't place who it was, but talked a lot about how growth can't exist where there's judgment right? Like as soon as you turn on judgment, the growth stops. And I think back when you said there's no such thing as in the back, I was laughing to myself. Um, I'm, I'm totally guilty of being one of those veterinarians, like in the exam room where it's like, oh, we just got to take fluffy to the back. Right. And you can just tell the owner is sitting there being like, well, what happens in the back? Like, right. what are you going to do? And like, sure, you can explain it as best as you think you are, but the client is nervous. Like this is the pet they love so much and you're going to take it to the back where who knows what is going to happen. So that is brilliant. I, I didn't know that. I hadn't heard that before. That is fantastic. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, honestly, I, I don't think that people will put up with the old way of veterinary medicine in another decade. I think that this is going to become the way that people expect to be treated because eventually veg is going to be a household name and people are going to say, you know, where's, if, if they have an emergency with their pet, they're not going to say, where's the closest emergency hospital. They're going to say, where's the closest veg because I know how I'm going to be treated. I've had people call us from, I had a girl call me from California where we don't have any veggies open yet, but she said, I, I follow you guys on Instagram and I know that you can call and speak directly to a vet. And so I just wanted to call and ask if I should go to an emergency vet. And, and so I, I spoke to her on the phone and, you know, kind of gave her a rundown of what was going on with her pet. And she was so unbelievably grateful. So that, that's another thing that we do differently too, is, is um, doctors take all the triage calls, which is another kind of crazy thing. Like people hear this and, you know, I, I think, you know, you, you have one response or another, you, like people either have this visceral reaction where they're like, absolutely not. I'm never going to have, you know, an owner around me, or they're kind of like, well, that sounds a little crazy but it sounds also like it would work. And, and the second that I saw it, um, I will never forget the first time that I visited veg was the old hospital in white plains. It was 1800 square feet. I mean, it was this tiny, tiny little place. This is the first hospital that David Bessler ever bought. It is the most successful veg hospital that we have. Um, and it was a really busy night and I walked in and it was actually a guy who I, knew he was an intern at AMC when I was doing their, they had a, a pre-veterinary summer program. So I actually had already known him and I, I walked in and I was like, Oh, Hey, Hey George, how's it going? And you know, he's, I mean, he just had so many cases left and right, but he had, I think two things were waiting for a laceration repair, maybe two or three. And they, the owners of those animals were sitting on the ground. Um, you know, we had given them like some dog beds, they're chilling on dog beds. And, um, they ended up, they ordered a pizza, they exchanged phone numbers. They like became friends with each other and they didn't get mad because they, you know, things kept coming in left and right. So George had a hit by car and a pericardial effusion and a dyspneic cat. And it was just one thing after another. And the people sitting on the floor watching this happen, they were watching, you know, George go through the paces and, and we kept checking in and saying, I'm so sorry, it's going to be a 
little bit longer before the doctor can put stitches in your dog. And they said, that's okay. Like, that's totally fine. Those other dogs are, are way more unstable. And, um, Bessler was with me that night and he, he walks up to this sweet little old lady and he says, how's your experience been tonight? Is everything going okay? And she goes, oh my gosh, it's so wonderful. I can't wait to see what Dr. George does next. And it, it, it's like people are in, they're watching reality TV. That is what they feel like. Cause they get so excited and so immersed. I had this woman once, um, I had a dog with a lacrosse ball lodged in its throat. And so I'm, you know, immediately like taking things out, getting ready to trach this dog. Fortunately, we, we got it, got the ball out, but she, she was like, is it okay? Can I video this? This is really cool. Can I, is, is that all right? And we're like, yeah, like, come on in. And you know, they, I mean, they get so involved and then they really see the value in everything that we do. And they're so much more appreciative and they understand why there's a weight and it's, I mean, it truly is. It's the only way to practice veterinary medicine now in my mind. Like I just, I, I can't imagine doing it differently. So I've got to ask a couple questions here that are, because I've seen your Instagram posts. I've seen veggies posts on being large treatment um, splits yeah. in terms of rooms. How do you turn off? Meaning if you're on for your 10 hour shift, your 11 hour shift, 12 hour shift, whatever it is, and you're in front of clients the whole time, how do you, where, how, and where do you take a break? Cause extremely hard to be on that entire time. I don't ever feel like I have to. That's the thing is like, I, when you really love something, you don't feel like you need to take a break. You know, it's, it's like when I'm running a marathon, do I feel like I need to take a break? No, I'm like, I feel great. I'm going to keep going. Um, and that's how I feel when I'm on shift. I, it's just so energizing to be around my, my team, obviously they're all wired the same way that I am. They love helping people and their pets when they need it the most. And they love finding all of these different ways to say yes to people. Yeah. Um, and, and I think being around that energy, I don't, I don't need a break. That being said, like, yeah, when I, when I go home, of course I need to decompress it. That's a lot. It's, it's a big it's day. A it's a lot of using your brain. It's a lot of talking just over, yeah. you know, yeah. Lots, lots of exhausting conversations. Um, but, and I, and I do think it's important to have good practices when you go home, you know, I'm going to walk my dog, I'm going to cook myself dinner. I'm going to take a bath, like whatever it is to take care of yourself. And for a while, it took me a really long time to have good habits. I, I used to just come home and drink wine and mindlessly watch TV and that didn't re-energize me for the next day. Um, so I do think, I think it's important to know yourself and know kind of what you need to recharge. And I'm sure that there are some people who feel that they, they do need to be off. Right. Um, and you know, that's the one hard thing about our, our hospital in Denver is that our space is not very big. Yeah. So we don't really have like a records room or anything that's, where you can just kind of go. Yeah. We, we do have an amazing software and so we can finish records from home, um, Ideally, you're, you know, updating everything before you leave. Um, but I, I think that most of us, you know, yes, there are some days where, where you're like, okay, I, I just, I need to like not take another phone call anymore. Yeah. And I, I need to kind of be, be done for, for the day. Um, but I think that my teammates also recognize that. And so when the night shift doctor comes on and, you know, they say like, um, someone comes to us and says, there's a triage call on, you know, line eight or whatever. Can you grab it? The, the night doctor is going to go ahead and just jump on and, and do that. And so I, I think that, um, if anyone sees that somebody does need that space in, um, in their shift or, or that they are, they've been on for a long time and they need to take a, a, a step back, um, then we'll always recognize that in each other and, and support each other. But I personally, I just like to go, go, go. I'm, I hate it. If it's, if it's, you know, dull or if it's quiet, I, I want things to be busy and I want to feel like I'm on the entire shift. I've got to see what one of these practices look like in person. Oh yeah. You'll have to come visit once we're out of different. Once we're out of COVID, I'm, I'm sorry. The lighting is so here. We'll try putting it up here. Now. I was going to uh, say, I John, I don't have uh, window fixtures yet. Cause I just bought this house. So um, sorry that the light is so weird. No, Most people are just listening to this, so it doesn't matter. I was going to say, Jonathan, you must have more comments. Like you've been in hundreds and hundreds of, of yep. veterinary hospitals. Of course. And, and emergencies and specialties and all that. Like, 
I have a few, but that's a, I think an offline or another discussion related to the operations of the practice, as opposed yeah. to what we're discussing today, yeah. which is really, and they do blend together, right? We, we in our, in our groups now looking at what does wellness look like in the workplace? What is the space we need? So even for my new practice, I would like to have a quiet room where I've got a bike in there for somebody to be able to actually go do a little bit of exercise and some little weights. Like that's craziness that you could actually do that in veterinary medicine in 2021, but it's almost a necessity for when we're doing long-term uh, hours and timelines. And, and especially in emergency medicine, when you're on for 10 hours in emergency medicine, you're on and it, it, it can be long. No yeah. matter how much energy and, and excitement I have in it, I understand also the le the length of time um, can be difficult. So I, I appreciate hearing the other perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's something that our entire team is working really hard on. So we have always held the core belief that you should be able to nap during shifts. So we exactly. do um, mattresses. And then we actually have hammock hooks in all of our exam rooms. So you can hang a hammock and take a little hammock nap. Um, and then some of our newer hospitals, um, you know, they're always getting feedback from us in terms of design and, and the build out and everything like that. And our newer hospitals are going to be designed with Murphy beds in them. Yeah. So a room with a Murphy bed and then kind of more of a library area that would be just a little bit quieter, a place to kind of unwind, finish your records and um, everything like that. So that's the coolest thing about this company is I, they, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. Like they are always coming up with new things. Um, the hammock nap sold me immediately. Cool. I was, that's great. I mean, they provide fresh groceries for us. Like they take phenomenal care of us because they know that emergencies are, these are long shifts. It is there. It's difficult situations to be in. It can be really exhausting. And so they want to make sure that we have, you know, everything there to support us so that we can take care of our own mental health and when you know and, and take take those breaks when we need to and i I've, I've taken a nap on probably 80 percent of the overnights that i've done at veg they, it might only last for 20 minutes but it still is a quick little power nap and man it, it makes you feel pretty pretty refreshed it's the best feeling ever when you can get a nap between 4 and 6 a.m and yeah get up yeah. and take your cases on Definitely. Yeah, or we'll watch don't. Netflix and, you know, just kind of hang, yep. we'll, we'll cuddle with the patients and um, put, put a, you know, something on, on Disney plus or whatever. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so um, wonderful to have a, a company that actually encourages that instead of, you know, somewhere that would look down on that. Well, that's the majority. Like, so if we're speaking to 90% of even listeners right now, we are not in that frame of mind in veterinary medicine yet, without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. To, to, you know, if you want to take a nap, you're going on a sofa and you're hiding that you're actually taking a nap or you're yeah. going into a room somewhere and closing up. And well, that's not good. You're sneaking to the bathroom. They're like, or you're sneaking first, to the bathroom. I right? take five minute breaks in the bathroom to just take a reprieve. She, she didn't mention that. That was me that mentioned that, right? Just to get away. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you've got so much going on. Yeah. And I mean, the way I take naps is I actually leave the door open because I want my team to know, like, yeah. you know, if, if a pump goes off or the phone goes yeah. off, I'm going to be getting up and helping with that. Yeah. Um, so it's because it's allowed, then I don't feel that I have to, you know, hide anything or, you know, yeah, do, do anything sneaky, I guess. I don't know. I, I never necessarily felt that way before, but it certainly was not supported. Like I would just throw a blanket on the ground in a a radiology room. It was not comfortable. Um, so to, to have somewhere that says like, we want you to take a nap, that is revolutionary. So lots of people talk about also about bringing fresh groceries. And you mentioned that, is that a perk because there's more and more vet clinics that are going down that road. And is it, is it warranted? Do you think it makes a big difference to the, um, health and well being of your team members? Tell us a little more about that. Sorry, Mike, I'm jumping in here, but you got no, I I got ask. that makes a big difference because if you're on three or four shifts in a row and you know, there's 13 hours that the energy that you're going to have to cook for yourself is pretty minimal. So if there are healthier options that are in the hospital that are easily accessible, that you can just heat up and go, or, you know, we have a lot of just fruits and veggies and like things like that, that you can just kind of grab and go. Um, I think that that makes a huge difference. And I, I think it also just shows that, that our company cares about us, that they like, they want to feed us. And, um, 
you know, food, food is kind of the way to our hearts in veterinary medicine. Like that's how owners, you know, show us appreciation or how referring vets show us appreciation. Like that's always what it is, is they always bring you food. But I think we all get a little bit sick of donuts all the time. Like I don't even like donuts that much. And that ends up just making me feel more depleted. So actually having like good, healthy food available that I can grab on, on the go and, you know, stuff something in my face while I'm in between triages. Um, I, I think it's a genius way to, to keep your team, um, you know, going and, and also to let them know that you prioritize their health, that you want them to take care of themselves. Cause I think a lot of people, you know, you go, an entire shift and you realize you didn't drink any water and you didn't have any food and you didn't go to the bathroom once. And you're like, wow, that's, I really did a number on my kidneys today. So (laughs) not great. Mike, I have one more. I have one more. I have those. Yeah. (laughs) Auxiliary support team. So I heard in your triage segment there that you guys take as doctors, all the triages that you guys are bouncing in between. So I'm really interested to understand where you bring in your support team, your registered vet techs, et cetera, where they are becoming more and more of a needed capacity and, and are taking on more of the skills because of one, the shortage of veterinarians and two, just the number of the demand that we're seeing in a men- number of hospitals and, and clinics these days. What does that work like? What does that look like in your clinics? Yeah. So, I mean, I personally think that uh, a technician or assistant taking a history is a waste of their skills, right? Like they did not go to tech school to learn how to talk to owners and take histories. That's what we do. And so the kind of the flow at our hospital is most people actually do call us before they come in surprisingly. And so when they call, they speak directly with a doctor. When I'm on the phone with them, I will start typing up notes. So I actually already have the history written by the time they come in. And um, then I'll copy paste that into the medical record. And when I walk over to um, you know, the triage, basically they walk into the treatment area and the receptionist or assistant will say, this is Dr. Nelson, she'll be right over. Uh, the technicians and assistants start to get vitals. And then I walk over, do my physical exam. And we have a plan in place pretty much immediately because most of the time I've already told the owner over the phone, I've said, yeah, your dog ate a toxic dose of chocolate. What I'm going to do is I'll do a quick physical exam and then we're going to give it some apomorphine and make it vomit and X, Y, Z. And so I can jump straight from the physical exam to, you know, giving um, the technicians, this is what we're going to do, this dose, this route, et cetera. So they're really being used for their skills, their nursing care and their, their patient care, which is you know, especially at our hospital is so above and beyond. I mean, these girls, it's, it's not necessarily just even their level of medical expertise. It's the, I mean, the, the little things that they do, you know, to make our patients comfortable, whether it's um, laying on the ground with mm-hmm. them or, um, you know, they're, they're always like, sending pictures to the owners, FaceTiming with them, stuff like that. But anyway, it's, it is a far more efficient process and it really allows the technicians to do what the technicians need to do and the doctors to do what the doctors need to do. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I think, you know, at, at other jobs, I would hear technicians be on the phone for 10 minutes with an owner trying to get them to come into the hospital and saying, you know, it sounds like your pet's really sick. You should probably come in. And that's a waste of their time. They shouldn't be doing that. That's the the doctor should just say, I think you need to come in. And most people are not going to argue when they get to speak directly with the doctor. They just say, okay, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And they just come on in. So um, yeah, it really, really maximizes our flow. Yeah. I I love the, um, you know, some of the concepts are just taking sort of maybe old ways of thinking or ways other people have done it and flipping them completely on their head. You know, like I know so many vet clinics where you can't get a vet on the phone. Like that's, it's just not possible. Like, and they do that on purpose, like block that, that out. So it's neat hearing these and then seeing how that all comes together and plays out. Um, One, one more piece that I wanted to dive into, and I know we're getting a bit long, but I mean, whatever, we're just going to go long because it's a good conversation. Um, I understand now why you're so excited to get back to seeing clients. So in our pre-conversation, you had said that I can't wait to get away from curbside. And I was unaware of how, how you operated like with veg. So I, I get it now because it's such an important part of having the clients there. Um, so I just want to dive into this, you know, COVID we've had to move to curbside. 
um, you know, some of the, I guess, pros and cons, if, if there are any pros from your standpoint of curbside, um, what are your thoughts on all this? There are no pros to curbside. Like there's absolutely nothing good that I can see about it. I, I absolutely hate it. Um, if we were fortunate at veg that when we opened up in Denver, we were allowed to have customers in the building in the beginning. And so at least we were able to kind of build that reputation of trust, um, with practicing things the veg way. But then when the cases started to spike again in November, we did have to go to curbside and we are allowing people in for euthanasias and critical patients, but it is, I mean, you can already kind of tell just based on how I've described the way our hospital operates, it makes things extraordinarily inefficient. We also get very used to um, seeing everybody. So if I don't physically see an owner right in front of me, sometimes I'll forget about them. And that is, it's the worst because if you have eight triages happening at one time, which we often do, if all eight of those people are in front of me and I'm looking at them and I'm looking at their pets, I'm going to remember, oh yeah, that person's waiting on their radiology report and that person's waiting for me to go over blood work with them and things like that. When they're not physically in front of you, it's a lot harder to, you know, go through things in a more methodical manner. And I feel like I'm dropping the ball. That's why I really hate curbside is because I, I feel like it keeps me um, like I'm, I'm not working at my, my best and my most efficient mode without people there. Um, and then it also is just, it's, it's really awful and frustrating that we have to say, you know, we're taking your pet away from you. Like there's so many animals that have extreme anxiety away from their, their owners. And we might have to sedate them in cases where we otherwise wouldn't, if the owner could be there. And, so I, I really hate that part of it. I hate that if they are hospitalized, that they can't stay with them overnight if they want to. And again, I know that most people are like, that sounds insane that you would let an owner stay overnight. But that is the the thing that I'm most proud of being able to offer is being able to say like, yes, you can, you can sleep in the hospital with your pet. Um, so yeah, it's, it has been really difficult for all of my team. And, and I think it's just, it's ironic because I think it's really polarizing in terms of um, how emergency hospitals operate, because I have heard some people say, you know, I never want to go back to the normal way. I've heard some people say that they, uh, people that don't work for badge, obviously, um, but, you know, people say that, that they enjoy curbside. And I, I don't understand it because it's actually creating more frustration. Like owners are more frustrated because they're not seeing what's going on. And so if, if the reason that they like curbside is because they want minimal client interaction, they're actually making their job a lot harder for themselves because they're not giving that customer what they need, which is transparency. Yeah. That's fantastic. Anything to add in there, Johnny, before we start wrapping None up? at all. hundred percent. We are in a client centric <laughs> business and we all need to know that. Yeah. I mean, unless you want to be a pathologist and just cut up dead animals for a living, which I very much appreciate people who are in that profession, but you know, I mean, animals are attached to their people. And if we are not in this to help people too, then I think you have to really seriously reconsider the career path that you chose because that's that's the most fulfilling part of this is is being able to send home a pet with a happy owner you know and and seeing them reunited like it's all about the human animal bond and um yeah veg really preserves that bond yeah that's fantastic okay carrie thanks so much i mean this has been a great conversation um, we're going to move into our impact round. So a series of questions here, we're going to, going to fire at you. Uh, okay. So first off, are you a cat or a dog person? Oh, dog. I, yeah. I saw, I saw yeah. the, the guest uh, wandering yeah. around behind you there. So yes, that was Finn walking behind me. And I mean, dog slash horse, but like, if we're choosing one dog. Okay. <laughs> true, true or false. I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a kid. False. 
I knew that I needed animals in my life in order for me to be a normal human being and feel grounded and connected to my purpose in this world. But uh, yeah, I, I did not make that decision as I uh, discussed earlier. I did not make that decision until I was 19. Yeah. Nice. How would your friends describe what you do for a living? I would like to think that most of them describe it as badass. I think, I think a lot of them think that, but then I wonder if they actually think maybe it's just more chaotic. I think they're just like, your life is just kind of insane. So one of, one of the two chaotic and badass. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Uh, what is your favorite hobby? Uh, it'd be so hard to actually choose one. I mean, I guess I have to choose running as the, the one thing that like I really have to do every day or I'll, I'll go a little bit nuts, but riding horses and skiing are my other, other things that I really like can't, can't live without. Those are my religions. You're living in a good place of life. That's good. Uh -huh. Denver. Yeah. Cool. I was going to say that Denver is high on my list of places I want to get to. It just looks yes. like you definitely need to come. We'll be happy to, to show you what the veg hospital looks like when things are, are back in action. We'd love to have you visit. Nice. Awesome. What in this world are you most grateful for? My family. And I know that's a, probably a pretty stereotypical <laughs> answer, um, but I, truly I have such a, a wonderful support system with my family and my friends. And, um, you know, I, I think without having connection and and love like it you know we we wouldn't feel like we have a purpose so yeah nice okay carrie uh we're just about to wrap up here before we go thank you so so much for joining us taking the time out of your busy schedule um if anyone wants to reach out or get a hold of you or follow along um is there anywhere we can direct them to yeah. So my Instagram page is just at Dr. Dot Carrie Nelson. Um, and you spell my name K E R R I and Nelson, the traditional way, N E L S O N. Um, if, if you want to email me, you can email me at Carrie Nelson at veg dot vet. So V E G dot V E T. Um, you can check out anything veg related. If you are a student and you want to do an externship or you're interested in our early entry track program, there's a ton of stuff on our website, veg.vet. Um, and you can also just follow our company on um, Instagram at veterinary emergency group. Nice. Fantastic. And we'll drop that in the uh, show notes for everyone. Um, so thanks again, Carrie. And as always, uh, the final word goes to you. What message do you want to leave for the veterinary community? Oh, I feel like we touched on so many different things today, but I guess just don't, don't let your shame take away from your passion. You'll find it again. If you feel like you're in a place where you you're not sure what you're doing or why you're here. There are people in this profession who want to support you and who want to help you find your love for this career again. Um, and don't ever let anyone tell you that it's not sustainable because it is. You just have to find the, the right group of people to hold you up. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye.